I'm Scott Crow of OSA Outreach and welcome to Roger Williams Park Zoo. Today we're filming a video just for you guys here in Rhode Island and all of New England on a species that you've asked us so much about. Welcome to Venomous Snakes of New England. Here we're in the Northern Copperhead exhibit and also Timber Rattlesnake exhibit. Now I love showing you guys these videos, but what's extremely important is to understand the conservation of these species, especially the endangered Timber Rattlesnake. And we're very lucky enough to have any sort of exhibit like this here in Roger Williams Park Zoo to understand that and the efforts that are going on for the conservation of such a species. What's going on guys, it's Scott Crow from OSA Outreach and we're here in the Timber Rattlesnake Room. This is where they had a startup program for breeding and conservation of the Timber Rattlesnakes. What you guys are looking at is an adult male, right? And then we're also doing a lot of different programs where they're doing younger females with that breeding for the conservation of this endangered species of New England. This girl, boy, hasn't been tubed in a while. Look how clean that looks. All right, so here we have the timber rattlesnake. As you see how we uh, handled them here, we, we use these clear acrylic tubes um, to make handling them much more safer. Um, very strong animal. Um, the timber rattlesnake, very iconic New England animal. I mean, this was the first rattlesnake species encountered by the colonists uh, in Plymouth. Um, actually revered by the Narragansett Indians and the native uh, uh, New England Indians. Um, as a matter of fact, the sachem from the Narragansett tribe actually sent a quiver of arrows wrapped in a timber rattlesnake skin as a sign of war to the uh, original colonists. And even after that, Ben Franklin recognized the uniqueness of the rattlesnake species as truly being an American species. So, you know, this was almost our, our national symbol. Um, and even wanted it to be uh, on our flags, as you see our, the old uh, don't tread on me flag and many variations of that flag. Um, this, this animal held respect, um, not only again amongst Native Americans, but the early colonists. Um, it's an iconic species. This is a pretty big one. Uh, they can get up to about five feet long. Um, takes about seven years for them to be reproductively mature. Um, this is a male, right? So ecologically, timber rattlesnakes are very important in uh, their uh, rodent control. Um, these guys eat a lot of deer mice, uh, which is actually the first uh, host of the lion-carrying deer tick. Um, so again, they're uh, not only timbers, but all snakes, uh, especially rodent-eating snakes, value to the ecosystem is keeping rodent populations that could potentially spread disease under control. And they also play prey in the ecosystem as well. There are a lot of things that feed on timber rattlesnakes. I mean, we've seen large red-tailed hawks actually taking out timbers this large. Um, black racers, another native uh, New England snake, eat a lot of young timbers. They'll actually hang around the birthing rookeries waiting for mom to give birth so they can snap up a, a quick meal. Um, so they play both predator and prey in the ecosystem. Um, again, they're mature at about seven years old. They're not able to breed. Females breed every other, sometimes only every third year. So they're not a very fecund animal. Average litter size for these guys is about eight. Um, we have seen litters 12 or more, but eight seems to be about average. Um, also, these guys are uh, very strong, as you can see, and have this awesome adaptation, the rattle, um, which is actually segments of dead skin. People often ask, you know, are they little balls in there that make it rattle? And no, that's not the case at all. And every time this snake sheds its skin, it will get a new rattle at the base of the tail here. Um, and then what happens is these segments just hit up against each other to make that awesome sound. And they rattle it about 60 to 100 times per second, which uh, we could never shake that thing 60 to 100 times per second to make that awesome uh, vibration that they can do, which almost makes it sound like a hiss. And which is basically their main defense is this rattle right here, not their venom. 
just like we talked about with the copperheads, timbers can control the amount of venom they use and they'd rather not use that venom on you. They are cryptically colored as well, these guys not as brown and the brown hues, but again in their environment these guys can blend in really well. Hope that you don't see them, but if they do, then they're going to warn you with this rattle. And again, don't poke the sleeping bear. Um, in most cases, these animals are very docile. I mean, we've handled, I've handled hundreds of these things, never even came close to being bitten. Um, you watched me just put it in a tube, it wasn't striking at me. Um, you know, and again, most bites we find are from people trying to kill them or capture them, which is illegal. These are state endangered in all the New England states that they uh, occur in presently. Um, their range has shrunk in New England. Um, there are only five populations left in Massachusetts, a handful in Connecticut, one or two in Vermont, and just one left in New Hampshire, when they used to be pretty widespread, as well as Rhode Island. Uh, we lost our timber population in Rhode Island back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, was the last recorded timber rattlesnake, uh, and that was in Tiverton, Rhode Island. There are only three known records for timbers, or three known sites for timbers being in Rhode Island. And again, since the early 70s, there has never been another reported sighting of these. And believe me, me and my colleagues, we've been out looking for these guys. Um, but we often get calls that people do see them, um, but we've never actually had anybody send us a reliable photo or, or uh, proof that they're actually still out there. So. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not only Rhode Island, but Maine also had theirs extirpated. Um, pressures to these guys are habitat. These guys are very reliant on their den sites. Um, they return to those den sites every winter to brewmate and spend the winter. Um, and then once they emerge in the spring, um, they will actually uh, disperse into the landscape. Um, and any of the females that are pregnant of that year will remain close to the dens at what they call rookeries. Uh, to kind of heat them, heat the babies up, thermoregulate in the sun, and give birth at these rookeries. So you lose that habitat, you fragment that habitat, now you got roads traversing those habitats. Reptiles don't do re well with roads, whether you're a frog or a snake or a turtle. Um, you know, they do not uh, do well crossing roads. We see a lot of road mortality in certain populations with not only this species, but the northern copperheads as well. Um, then you add poaching and indiscriminate killing. A lot of folks kill these guys because they think they're gonna you know, eat their children or kill their dogs and you know, that's sad and again that's, that's, that's just lack of education of the natural history of this species and what it's all about. Um, and then we have poachers. We do have uh, problems in New England with folks actually poaching these animals for the black uh, market pet trade. Um, and uh, we even have uh, dens being monitored for that poaching activity. Um, it's a big, big issue uh, for the conservation of this snake. Um, and then now we have found within the populations uh, an emerging fungal disease. This snake fungal disease is uh, affecting uh, just about every population of this snake in New England. Um, the zoo here in our veterinary department did a two-year study looking at the prevalence of that disease. Uh, and now that study has continued and expanded to 11 more states being administered by the state of Massachusetts. Um, so we're keeping an eye on that emerging disease. And again, now that we have such fragmented populations, we got very little genetic swapping going among these populations. So we're afraid that some of these populations might be getting a little bit genetically bottlenecked, um, which is now making their immune systems uh, a little less functional and not able to fight off the fungus uh, as they would have been able to many, many years ago. Guys, I just want to thank Lou Parati, the AZA Association, and I want to thank Roger Williams Park Zoo for these, uh, the dedication and the conservation for these non-chasmatic species. We're looking at species that we're trying to conserve because they're not fluffy, they're not chimpanzees, they're not tigers, they're snake species, but they're species we love and we don't have the right to pick and choose what animals we save and what animals we don't save. And you can see right here with Lou, he loves these animals, we love these animals, and we want you guys to love these animals and if you guys have any questions make sure you check us out we'll give a link at the bottom of this video where you guys can find it see what you guys can do to help conservation